a study done in 2014 by Nature Reviews Neuroscience found that uncertainty disrupts many mental processes that govern routine action. This disruption causes conflict in the brain. And this conflict can lead to a state of both hypervigilance and outsized emotional reactivity to negative experiences or information. It is an activation of our fight or flight syndrome uh, response and never being able to turn it off. That's what uncertainty does. In other words, uncertainty makes people overly worried about everything. It causes people to see threats everywhere they look. It causes them to have irrational thoughts. It causes them to make irrational decisions. It causes people to not be their normal selves. The condition is not fun. It is a condition of human suffering. It is during these times of uncertainty that people tend to look for leadership, for relief. They look to those who will calm their fears. They will look to those who will give them direction towards safety. They look to those who will ease their suffering. They look to those who will give them an idea of what the future could look like, even if the future is bad. Because at least, if the future is bad, at least it is no longer uncertain. But here's the problem. Here's the problem. Nobody in the entire world has any idea of what the future looks like right now. There are literally no leaders in the entire world that can definitively give us a hope for the future. There's nobody in our government. There's nobody in our communities. There's nobody in our households. Your boss at work, regardless of whether or not they're putting up a strong front or not, I'm going to let you in on a little secret. They have no idea what the future looks like. And as a matter of fact, they themselves might be caught up in the fear of the unknown, causing them to make irrational decisions that affect you, their employee. But folks, church, Christians, I really believe that this is a tremendous opportunity. This is a tremendous opportunity for Christians to step into the gap. Because we are a people who believe in Jesus' statement, do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about itself. We are called to exemplify peace in the face of fear and lead those who are suffering towards the green pastures and still waters of Jesus. We, the church, are called to alleviate the sufferings of this world and to point all glory to Jesus. This is our moment, church. Last week, Pastor Clay ran the anchor leg of our phenomenal series on joy. And this week, I am pleased to be introducing our new series on leadership titled, Take the Lead, Leadership in a Time of Uncertainty. The central question that I want to address over the next four weeks is how does one lead through times of uncertainty? How does one lead at work? How does one lead in their community? How does one lead their families and their households? How do you lead yourself? I want to address this question in the context of our workplaces today. And for this, we turn to the story of Joseph, outlined in Genesis 39. But before we jump into the passage, let us pray. Lord Jesus, I just want to thank you so much for being the king of this world, the leader of this world, and the only one in existence that knows what's going on right now. And Lord, we believe that this message is specifically tailored to us, your church, your bride. God, will you motivate us today? Will you burn our hearts within our chests today? Will you give us that extra push to go out and be leaders in this world during this time of uncertainty? Thank you for all that you're about to accomplish in this space. 
We pray all these things in your name. Amen. Amen. How does one lead at work during times of uncertainty? Now, before we jump into the passage, I have to give you a little bit of a backstory of what's going on with Joseph. Okay? Joseph, when he was a child, was an arrogant child. He was the youngest of 12 brothers and his father's favorite. And one of the defini defining qualities of Joseph was the, the boy just had no tact. He just really had no tact. Because, you know, God blesses him with a vision about his brothers ultimately bowing down to him, bowing down to him and serving him in the future. Now, a person with tact would understand that his brothers hold his life in his hands and probably would have kept that to himself and let it just encourage him and just let it all play out. That's what a person with tact would have done. But Joseph decides to flaunt this dream in front of his brothers. Long story short, his brothers sell him to a bunch of merchants for about $5 in today's currency, who those merchants sold him to Potiphar, the captain of the guard in the land of Egypt. Now, while Joseph was serving in Potiphar's house, the captain of the guard, Potiphar's wife took a liking to him. Long story short, Joseph refuses her advances, and so she tells her husband lies that would get Joseph thrown into prison. And this is where we pick up. Genesis 39, 19 says, When his master heard the story, his wife told him, saying, this is how your slave treated me. He burned with anger. Joseph's master took him and put him in prison, the place where the king's prisoners were confined. Now, these are the king's prisoners. These aren't normal prisoners. These are the war criminals. These are the foreign POWs. These are the, the most heinous of criminals. This is maximum security prison. And Joseph is put into this prison with all the rest of the king's prisoners. Now, Joseph would be in prison for seven years. And he would have, during those seven years, he would have absolutely no idea when his sentence was up. There was no sentencing. There was no jury. There was only a judge. And he was thrown into prison and no sentence. He, 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 there, there was no time he had to do. There was no end date that he knew that he had to get to. His future is cloudy. It is uncertain. He's left in the prison hoping, just hoping that someone will remember him because that's how it happened back then. They didn't keep documents of who was in prison and things like that. They just threw him in prison. You know? <clears throat> And not only is, is he struggling with the fact that, you know, maybe nobody's going to remember him, even if they do, who's going to release someone who's been accused, about, uh, accused of advancing upon the wife of the captain of the guard? Joseph is in a time of uncertainty. We certainly are in a time of uncertainty. Our future is cloudy, isn't it? We ask Lots of questions. Probably the number one thing on, on our mind is how long is this pandemic going to last? When is there going to be a vaccine? What's going to happen with schools? What's going to happen with church? What's going to happen with work? Some of you are already affected. Some of you have no work. You've been furloughed. You've been laid off. Maybe some of you have been just straight up fired. And you have no idea when the next job is going to come. There is no timeline for you. You are in a state of uncertainty. Some of you are faced with the decision on whether to go back to work or not when school starts. A New York Times article that I read recently says that there's going to be a huge decline in employment in September for working moms because they have to make the decision on whether to stay home and make sure their kid navigates online learning okay and whether to go to work 
and to risk their child getting infected at daycare. Teachers, those of you who are in the education system, I want you to know my heart is with you. You have to make the difficult decision to whether to risk getting sick or not having a job at all. Who knew that one day we would be having a conversation about whether being a teacher should qualify for hazard pay? We are in a time of uncertainty when the future is cloudy and unclear. But this, my friends, this, my brothers and sisters, this, my church, is the moment of leadership. When crisis hits and the future is unclear, this is where leadership is sorely needed. This is where we need people to step into the gap and provide the reassurance and the direction that the world so sorely needs. This is where Christians need to step in and show that leadership. So how? We have our call. So how do we do this tangibly? How do we exercise leadership during this time of uncertainty? Let's go back into the passage. But while Joseph was there in the prison, the Lord was with him. He showed him kindness and granted him favor in the eyes of the prison warden. So the warden put Joseph in charge of all those held in the prison, and he was made responsible for all that was done there. The warden paid no attention to anything under Joseph's care because the Lord was with Joseph and gave him success in whatever he did. Chapter 40, verse 1 says, Some time later, the cupbearer and the baker of the king of Egypt offended their master, the king of Egypt. Pharaoh was angry with his two officials, the chief cupbearer and the chief baker, and put them in custody in the house of the captain of the guard in the same prison where Joseph was confined. Now pay attention to verse 4 here. The captain of the guard assigned them to Joseph, and he attended them. The captain of the guard assigned them to Joseph, and he attended them. Them. Here is a profound truth that is, that, that is being revealed right here in this text. Here's the truth. The work of leadership is different than the position of leadership. The work of leadership is different than the position of leadership. The warden put Joseph in charge of all the other prisoners. He didn't give Joseph a position. He didn't give him a title but he gave him a job. He gave him a work. He gave him the work of leadership. We here in America, we have a tendency to associate the position with the work, do we not? We see presidents and kings, coaches and CEOs and see their high positions. We assume that since they have the position, they must be good at the work. But we all know that that's not true. In the heart of our hearts, we know that that's not true because we've all been under bad leadership before. We've all been subjected to leadership that though they hold the position, they're terrible as a leader. Something that has been revealed in this time of uncertainty is that bad leaders are being exposed, aren't they? The work of leadership is different than the position of leadership. We also have a tendency to want the position more than the work. We look at management, we look at our superiors and silently envy their positions. We want all the accolades that are associated with that position, the corner office, the parking spots, the invitations out drinking with the boss, the freedom to operate the way that we see fit, the love, the respect, the accolades, from our coworkers. If this is you, I get it and I relate because I too suffer and have suffered from the disease of upward mobility. I call it a disease because I know it rules your mind. And it keeps you from fully enjoying the life that God has given you. It also holds you back, ironically, 
that drive towards upward mobility ironically holds you back from the true potential that is inside you. Confession time. I come from a long line of very driven individuals who are constantly wanting to achieve the next level. Now, on the surface, that sounds like a good thing, but I assure you, after struggling with this disease for many, many years, I assure you, it is not. I worked very hard to gain positions in the past. And if, I, if I'm perfectly honest, now that I reflect back upon my younger years, now that I have a few more gray hairs of wisdom, I can see what... Um, I can see the error of my ways. I worked very hard to gain these positions in the past. And if I'm perfectly honest, it wasn't because I wanted to do the work of leadership. I wanted it because positions mean power. Power means love and respect. And given my background, it is love, connection, and relationship that I have been chasing my entire life. And though I know that positions, cranially, I know that positions only buy me temporary scraps of that love and attention that I crave, at the time, it is all that I had. So I worked endlessly hard to attain those scraps of love and attention. But what I didn't realize was that the work of leadership is different than the position of leadership. What is the difference? What's the difference between the work of leadership and the position? Verse 4 says, The captain of the guard assigned them to Joseph, and he attended them. Joseph attended to. He took care of the other prisoners. He took care of the ones who didn't speak Egyptian. He may have translated for them. He took care of the ones who had the mental illnesses. He sat with them as they went through their manic states. He sat with those who were going crazy from the trauma of being imprisoned and having an uncertain future like he. He took care of, he attended to the foreign ones. He attended to the domestic ones. He attended to the murderers. He attended to the rapists, to the traitors, and to the menaces of society. He attended to all of them. Christian leaders, during this uncertain time when people are searching for direction, searching for answers, searching for certainty, they need to be attended to. There is a season, leaders, there is a season for knowing direction, influencing people and carrying your teams towards a goal. There is a season in which the traditional duties of a leader come into play. But this is not that season. This is the season to listen, to care for, to send gifts to, to be generous to whom God has entrusted you with at work. In a season where things are uncertain, you must lead by attending to your coworkers, your boss, your subordinates. How does one lead at work during times of uncertainty? Attend to your coworkers. So what does that look like? Tangibly speaking, what does that look like? Well, I've got three leadership schools. I read a lot of leadership books, and I've got three leadership skills that I will um, share with you here. There was a woman, um, there is a woman by the name of Anne Mulcahy, um, who is the former CEO of Xerox. She was named the CEO of the year in 2008 by Chief Executive Magazine. She's also been the member, uh, members of the board of Catalyst, Citigroup, and target. She is a leader of leaders, folks. And she said this, employees are a company's greatest asset. They're your competitive advantage. You want to attract and retain the best, provide them with encouragement, stimulus, and make them feel that they are an integral part of the company's mission. Employees are a company's greatest asset. Value people over the tasks. Leaders, those of you who, <clears throat> whom the Lord has put you in a position of leadership, I want you to know that you are doubly, doubly responsible for the work of leadership. 
In this season, I'm sure for many of you who are supervisors, bosses, team leaders, or managers, you have noticed that the quality and quantity of your team's work may have taken a step backwards. And if this is the case for you, don't berate your team like the world does. Instead, attend to them. Here's a fact. During this time of uncertainty, when brains are tired from the uncertainty, people are emotional, they're making irrational decisions, or ha and they're having irrational thoughts. They are struggling. They are tired. They are tired of COVID. They are tired of the unknown. Cut them some slack. Your subordinates and your coworkers are tired of Zoom meetings. You know that? If you are in a position of leadership, may I challenge you to maybe do some work and figure out how to continue running and maybe cut down on a few of these Zoom meetings. I understand that work needs to get done and the performance of your team is paramount to your job. But if your team performance has taken a hit, can I challenge you not to berate and push, but to accept that some work is just not going to get done? And instead, attend to your subordinates. Take care of them. Be generous with their time off. Show more grace when they don't perform well. Invest in them. Invest in the people. Let the tasks take a back seat during this season of uncertainty. Value people over tasks. Number two, check in with people. Check in, follow up. This is such an important skill. This cannot be understated. There was a, pro, there was a moment in time where I thought that checking in was kind of just like lip service kind of thing. That wasn't really that important. But in my 40 years of life, it was only recently where I started to realize, wow, it is of the utmost importance to check in and to follow up. This skill cannot be understated. A phone call or a text to a coworker. How are you doing? And when they reply with the, uh, with, with the uh, political, politically neutral statement, I'm fine, I'm good, work is good, everything is good, follow up and say, no, 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 no. How are you really doing? I want to know. And if they trust you enough to give up that information, encourage them, listen to them. Be present with them. They are going through the same difficulties as you are. This is an opportunity for you to lead them by attending to them. Value people over tasks. Check in with people. Finally, influence your superiors. Influence your superiors. Everybody has a boss. Even your boss has a boss. Okay? Here's an interesting question. How does one lead when you're not the one in charge? How do you do the work of leadership when you don't have the position of leadership? Your superiors, I'm going to give you a big surprise, okay? Your superiors have no idea what they are doing in this season. No one, none of us do, okay? They're making this up as they go along. And the interesting thing is that science shows that during a crisis, people can be much more open-minded. In this case, folks, when your superiors are struggling to figure out what the future looks like, perhaps this is your time to humbly, humbly offer ideas. Because even if they don't use your ideas, the fact that you are offering them is interpreted as love for the team and love for them. Humbly offer ideas, but also ask them questions. Get really, really good at asking questions during this season. Ask them questions about things that you're curious about. Ask them questions that you already know the answers to. Because when you ask leaders questions, it solidifies your confidence in their leaderships. Leader love to be asked questions. For those of you who are out of work, my heart is with you. And I hope that the Lord opens up a door for you. But perhaps this is a time for you to 
focus on leading and attending to those whom God has entrusted you that has nothing to do with work. Perhaps in your community, at church, look for ways to attend to those who are over you and under you at the church. Take care of your community. Get really good at attending to your family. And for those of you who are single, who have no family, this is the time to get really, really good at attending to yourselves. I'm not going to get in any more further into these, these uh, top sp- topics because we're going to cover them over the next four weeks. We do this, folks, not because Joseph did it, though. We are Christians. We don't do this because Joseph did it, but because Jesus did it. Joseph was clearly a great leader. He ended up being a great leader. And he is one to be emulated, no doubt, no doubt there. But we are not Joseph followers. We are Jesus followers. Jesus, the night before he would be betrayed, was celebrating Passover with his disciples. And in the middle of the celebration, he would get up, leave the room and come back wearing nothing but a towel wrapped around his waist like a servant would. And then he brought a basin of water and individually began to wash the feet of his disciples one by one. John 13 says, when he had finished washing their feet, he put on his clothes and returned to his place. Do you understand what I've done for you? You call me teacher and Lord, and rightly so, for this is what I am. Now that I, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also should wash one another's feet. I have set you an example that you should do this. Do as I have done for you. Pay attention here, verse 16. Very truly I tell you, no servant is greater than his master, nor is a messenger greater than the one who sent him. Now that you know these things, you will be blessed if you do them. No servant is greater than his master. Essentially what Jesus is saying is, if the master is a servant, then the servant is a servant. The servant will not be greater than the master. There are all kinds of different styles of leadership. There's autocratic, there's authoritative, there's lazy, fair. There's a whole bunch of them, and we're not going to get into all of them. Christians, in this time of uncertainty, the leadership that we display should not be any of these types. It should not be any, about, uh, any of these types of leadership. It should not be autocratic leadership or lazy, fair leadership or authoritative leadership. The leadership that we should be displaying here is servant leadership. We are servants because our king was a servant. He had the position of a king and he put a towel around his waist and did the work of a servant by attending to his disciples. He was in very nature God, yet he made himself nothing by taking on the very nature of a servant. As such, during this time of uncertainty, when the future is unknown, when nobody has any answer, let us do as our king has done. Let us attend to our coworkers. Let us wash their feet. Let's wash the feet of our coworkers. Let's wash the feet of our superiors. Let us wash feet because we are Christians. Let us wash feet because we are servants like our king. Let's pray. <clears throat> Lord Jesus, what crazy times we live in now where everybody is on edge when nobody knows the future. And Jesus, I believe that this is a time where you're asking us to trust you 
and that both past, present, and the future is all in your hands. And Lord, I believe today that you have asked us, your church, to step into the gap and do the work of leadership to those who are suffering around us. God, I believe that there are so many people who are listening to this message right now who have their hearts burning in their chest. You're, <laughs> you're even putting the names and faces of people in their heads right now. Lord, will you give them the proper heart, the proper motivation? Will your Holy Spirit challenge them to lead these people that are in their minds through these crazy times. Thank you, Jesus, for your message. We pray all these things in your name. Amen. We have a few next steps for you. Um, next step number one, I would like to speak to someone about Jesus being my Lord and Savior. Hey, that is the number one next step every single week. If you do not know of this Jesus who washes feet and attends to his disciples, check off this box on your communication card or on your app and somebody will get in contact with you and maybe we can have a conversation about this. Second, I will wash the feet of three of my coworkers this week. I believe just like how I prayed that there are at least three people in your mind right now. Will you make the decision to wash their feet this week, not literally, figuratively, to attend to them. And if this is you, please check this box off. Next step number three, I will check in with my boss this week. You know, your boss is a person too. And he or she has feelings. He or she is stressed out just like you are. Check in with them, ask them how they're doing. Ask them how they're really doing. For I will log into emetro.org slash pray and receive prayer today. Do you know that there are pastors every single week on Zoom who are willing to sit and pray with you and to listen to you? Will you make the decision today to log on to emetro.org slash pray and receive prayer today? Finally, our final next step is <clears throat> Yo hablo español y consideraré ser parte de un equipo para crear un grupo pequeño para apoyar a nuestros vecinos de habla España. Gracias, Google. My Spanish is about as good as my Korean. <laughs> That's true. <laughs> hey, if this is you, as Pastor Sunita talked about the, um, early on when she was uh, moderating, hey, we're looking for some Spanish-speaking people to serve the community of Inglewood. If this is somebody, if, if, um, if you or somebody that you know is interested in serving in this way, will you check off that box and we'll get in contact 